Um, without further ado, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you this evening our speaker, who is um, the Reverend Canon Lloyd Casson, a uh, retired priest to the Diocese of Delaware. Lloyd has served in a variety of places, including the Washington Cathedral. Um, I'm venturing, I guess, what he's most proud of is knitting together two congregations in Wilmington, uh, St. Andrew's Parish and St. Matthew's Parish, uh, which is um, um, uh, a predominantly black and white congregation that became one. They're celebrating their 25th anniversary um, this year, and it's a wonderful uh, a congregation in the life of the diocese. But Lloyd's been around. He's He's been in um, Wilmington uh, uh, much of his career, and he's seen some things. And so I asked him to come tonight and just share uh, a little bit about his life and experience. Again, if you have questions, please chat. Uh, type them in the chat. Don't interrupt him, uh, and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. So without any further ado, uh, over to you, Lloyd. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, Jeff, uh, you've got a great rector in Jeff. I mean, and it's, uh, I just love seeing your website and seeing what's going on at St. Peter's. And uh, I think it's got to be one of the liveliest parishes in the diocese. So I'm glad to be here. And I'm really glad that you're having a series like this. And uh, J Jeff has already said that uh, mine is going to be a little more freewheeling. It's going to be more than that. I decided um, after much prayer and thought um, that I'm going to do something that I've never done before. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to share my story. And in that story, um, I'll be talking about um, my experience growing up uh, in Delaware. I'll be talking about as, a, as I got older, what it what about civil rights struggles and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm also going to be talking about some of my own development. And the reason that I think this is important is because I believe that everyone, every one of you needs to do the same thing. I believe that if, if there's a role for the church in these very difficult times, it's recognizing that we cannot go back. It's recognizing that um, only the healing um, of, of America's original sin, in which all of us partake, all of us, um, that's, that's our role. And we can no longer allow ourselves to be identified strictly with the status quo. We are called to be troublemakers in the best sense of that word, to express the love of God as we know that love in Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And, and, and there's no compromise about this. And I think that that's what we're learning in this time, in this time of, of uh, liminal space with this um, um, uh, pandemic and everything else that's going on. There's something that God is calling us to be and do that we have not been. And I think that this is, uh, this is a very difficult time, but I think it's a, a wonderful time. It's a great moment in the life of the church if we step up and be what we are meant to be. That's enough of the sermon, but I just feel very strongly about that. And so I, I want to start off with that. Let you know that that's where I'm going to be coming from all the way. I didn't always think this way. I grew up um, uh, in, I was born in Dover in 1935. Did you know I was that old? <laughs> and uh, and uh, um, um, I, in Dover, and interestingly, the house that I was born in, 308 North Street, is now the area where the police department is. I'm not so sure what what that says, but uh, that you, I, I recognize the tree that I used to climb. It's that's somewhere near uh, the buildings that are there now. But uh, that's where I was born, and uh, within two or three years, I was a foster kid. My parents just really couldn't make it. This is depression time, you know, and uh, they, they had their problems and so on. But in any case, my brother and I, I'm, a, I'm one of, of six siblings, um, and I'm a twin. And my brother, the twin, and one older brother were, were made wards of the state of Delaware. Uh, I would say I was about three, maybe four years old. Um, and um, my older brother, uh, was sent 
one place, and then my brother, my twin, and I were sent to another place. They didn't want to break up the twins. So after uh, two foster homes, I ended up um, with my brother again in Wilmington, um, where I where we stayed until um, we went to the military um, around 16 or 17 years old. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that growth experience. One of the first things I, I want to tell you, which I think is uh, incredible looking back, is that I didn't know that I was an at-risk child, as we now define foster kids. Um, I was ashamed of being a foster kid, but that was simply because of my shame about being broken up from my own family. So in school, when I had to have my guardian's name down on a report card, and, and, that, and, and, and her name was not Cassie, that was a, always a real problem for me. It took a long time for me to get over the shame of, of that. But in fact, in terms of growing up, um, at those moments in Delaware and Wilmington, um, I, I don't think I had it any worse than any, anybody else because I happened to be uh, in a foster home. As a matter of fact, my foster mother and father um, required that we call them aunt and uncle and that we stay in touch with our mother, uh, which I think was a very enlightened thing to do all the way back then. And I think it, it, it helped. Um, so I, I didn't have a total loss of ancestry, if you know what I'm, I'm getting at, which, which became important in my life later on. But here's what I can tell you about growing up in Wilmington. Um, most of you who are Delawareans and old enough to know, know how entirely racially segregated the state of Delaware was. As you heard Mark say last week, um, that even though um, um, the, the sympathies of the upper two counties were, were basically for the North, um, it didn't change the law. Um, and I mean, when I say law, I mean law for a while. Um, Wilmington was entirely segregated. Um, we had every school that I attended, it was public school, from kindergarten through high school, uh, 12th grade, was in a, in a black school. Um, I attended public school number five and number 29. There were other schools, 21, 20, and so on. And um, all of our teachers were, of course, were, were African-American, were basically, maybe a few Caribbeans, not many. Um, uh, but that's the way it was the whole time. And I have to admit that in the beginning, I didn't think there was anything the matter with it. You know, when you're very young, it's just you're in the world and you just sort of live uh, the, way, the way things are. So that's just the way things were. We walked to school. We lived on the east side, basically. And we walked to school blocks. I don't think I ever saw a school bus until I was in high school when people from Dover and the south uh, to, in order to get to a high school in the state of Delaware at the time, would get on a bus and come to Howard School, or uh, they would stay with the family in Wilmington um, and, and go home on weekends or something like that. So, but it was not, um, there was nothing strange to me about being in an all black school with an all black administration and black teachers and so on. It began to be strange when I saw certain things which I'll describe in a minute. Um, but one of the things that, that I, I still remember, even as a young child, with all the, the school books, which by the way, never had pictures of anybody black. Alice and Jerry, were, I still remember the first books that I had to learn to read were Alice and Jerry. It was little white kids, little white boy, little white girl, all there, you know. And that was the norm. It was, think about that. That was the norm. And as a, as a child growing up, before you're thinking for yourself and really conscious, um, you, you sort of assume that that's the norm. And there wasn't, at that point, there wasn't anything the matter with that. But then as I grew older and realized that every single textbook that I used was a hand-me-down from one of the white schools in Wilmington. And the, the plates, the actual name plates 
with, with students' names going back a decade or more. And I, when, I, when it first was that way, I wondered, um, I wonder if my name is in, in, in some school somewhere. Because I used to be, be sort of intrigued by the names and I wonder who that is and so on. And whose book am I reading? You know, you get sort of spiritual and think about things like this. Um, and it was a while before I realized that this was, this was the, the Wilmington Public School District um, and school board decision um, that, that the budgets in the, in, the, in, the, in the black schools did not cover new textbooks. Um, in the high school, we had a beautiful building built by Pierre S. DuPont uh, in, the, in the 1920s, um, the, the new Howard School. And it had a gym and auditorium and everything. So it was pretty well, well fixed in a way. But, but for all of that time, um, we were receiving hand-me-downs for most things. That's, so that was one of the first things that I noticed that was troublesome. This is, I'm just sticking with school for a minute. Um, the other thing that I, I began to realize somewhere between third grade and sixth grade, especially, and maybe, and even in high school, is that the, the administration of the, of the public school system, of course, was all white. And these administrators would show up unannounced and had the privilege of interrupting the classes that we were in. Not just to say, hello kids, I'm glad to see you and, and, is there, and glad to be here and all that sort of thing, but to in effect take over the class and teach us a song, some stupid song, <laughs> the music person, for example, or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or another teacher, you know, sort of interrupting and, and watching our teachers sort of stand back with their arms folded while this shenanigans happened. And so I began to be um, concerned, at least, about what this was. And I didn't realize, um, at first, I don't think that um, there was anything wrong with it, but it was strange, let's put it that way. Um, so, so that was my school. Um, my, my school experience. I, I could tell you a lot more about my school experience. Um, I can tell you this, that it is not true that black schools don't have quality education and that because they're black, they can't possibly have a quality education. And I, I, as I grew older and, and in high school and beyond, I began to realize that that was the thought, um, that, um, Integration of schools, by, by the time it's had in my way, I was in the army, but the, even the conversation about the integration of schools implied that I would not have a quality education unless it was white oriented, unless it was white controlled. Um, it just wasn't possible, just wasn't possible. And yet, because our teachers um, couldn't teach in white schools, very well educated teachers, PhDs and all that sort of thing. We had fabulous education. Uh, and, I, and I say that because um, I left uh, high school, joined the army, was in the army for four years, came back and went to the University of Delaware. And in my um, freshman year at the University of Delaware, I was reading Chaucer and people like that in English and Les Miserables in French. And I had all that in high school. So, so I'm, my education was not a bad education. And it is, a, it's, it's um, but that's really the, the tag that gets placed on, 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 on quote, education that is black um, uh, control. Um, that's not the problem with an all black school, that the kids can't learn anything in an all black, in an all black situation. The other thing that, um, that was interesting to me growing up was that the phrase, it takes a village really defined my growing up. I mean, it was unbelievably a love fest. Um, every, no matter on the east side, no matter where you were, adults knew who you were. And if you were doing something wrong, I can still hear people saying to me, 
ain't you Mary's boy? What are you, what are you doing? I mean, this it was an incredible, incredible support system. We were loved, um, really loved. The other thing is um, the, the spirituality, religion was so much a part of, of our life. What I was um, began, began to take for granted, for example, is that the same people who taught me in elementary school and high school were also the teachers in Bible school. And they were also the, the, the counselors, the recreation counselors at the park and the lifesavers at the pool. And so there, were, there was a kind of, of um, family. Um, so again, um, it, it, it must not be known or felt that, that in and of itself, um, that growing up in a black surrounding in and of itself um, is, is the worst thing that could happen. For reasons that we all know, it's not a good thing. But we have defined it um, negatively so that every, the inspiration even for consolidation is to um, make sure not that white students have a better education, but that black students do. And that's very important to remember. It just is, because that's the way it was. Now, um, I can tell you a lot more about uh, growing up in Wilmington. For example, there were blocks uh, beyond Market Street, the main drag in Wilmington, that I dared not go. I mean, Dare not go. Used to almost have a, have to have a little note. There was a, a laundromat at 8th and Lombard Street that was run by a Jewish guy. And it was one of the few laundromats, I guess, in Wilmington, because people came from all over to have their clothes washed. And um, the, uh, the, I can't remember the, the, the owner's name now, but he and employees would fold people's laundry. And so that when they came back, their, their laundry would be all folded and so on. And us kids would, would have our wagons and deliver some of these, this laundry. I used to love doing it. It gave me a chance to walk uh, you know, around Wilmington beyond places that I knew. But there were places that I couldn't possibly go without having to explain why I'm there. And it was always a scary proposition many, many times. And there were places that I just refused to deliver anybody's on. I just wasn't going to go there. Uh, I can name some of the neighborhoods like Ellesmere and places like that. So, and, and other places. Um, but that was the way it was growing up. Uh, the interesting thing about growing up in that time was the, the um, what was happening to us internally. What I was becoming aware of is that I, I had two faces. I had a black face and I had another consciousness, the, the, the norm. Um, so that when I went into places that were white, I had to be something other than who I was. Um, I almost would have to make, make an excuse for for being present in places that were white. It was terrible. Um, and, and of course, growing up, most public accommodations um, were not integrated in any way at all. I mean, I've been turned out of more restaurants uh, than you can shake a stick at, or sitting up in a balcony in a theater and so on. So, and yet at the same time, some really beautiful things were happening. Number one, um, when I was a kid growing up in the Y, the Y, the junior high and senior high, I was in the high Y, the junior high Y and the senior high Y, with uh, volunteers um, who would who would be a part of the Y, and 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 be our our teachers, our guides. And there's a, a guy named Mario Greco, whom I will never forget as long as I live, a Greek, who was in charge of our. Um, he was a sort of counselor for our high wide. And he took it upon himself 
to really help us to broaden our horizons. First of all, a very religious guy himself, he made it a point to take us visiting other churches, synagogues, Greek Orthodox churches, and so on. And it was just an, an incredible uh, mind expanding, spirit expanding uh, experience. Um, I think I'd already had a kind of spiritual intuition growing up anyway. Um, I grew up in the African, well, started the AUMP church, the church that Mark talked about last week that Peter Spencer founded um, <clears throat> when I was very, very young. But Mr. Greco uh, took me to an Episcopal church. Uh, it was the former St. Matthew's Church which was just a storefront on French Street. And I could not get over the, the beauty of the worship. Um, and you know, uh, to tell the truth, I, I, I think I had been traumatized in a lot of uh, sort of Pentecostalist oriented churches where people would get happy and shout and all that sort of thing. And I, I think that probably wasn't you know, I, did, I didn't, that didn't connect with me. I, I was more frightened by it than, than you know, uh, touched by it. So this, this thing at St. Matthew's where they chanted and they did things that I'd never seen before. Uh, and so I sort of put it in my pocket to remind myself that someday I was going to go back and, and visit that church. Well, um, by the time I was in the... Uh, um, my my high school, just after junior high school, maybe eighth or ninth grade, I went to St. Matthew's Church. And by that time, the rector of St. Matthew's, Father Donald Wilson, had come from Connecticut and to really build up this parish. And he came to Howard School and recruited us. It was, it was great, like a Pied Piper. And before you know it, we were all playing basketball and we had leagues and we were, it was just an incredible experience. And it made me really get a sense of, of what the church could be. I mean, I wasn't looking for a church, uh, you know, to be like a minister or anything like that, but just a place that would be just a, a good, solid experience growing up. Um, but it was, uh, you know, Father Wilson, really Anglo-Catholic, so we, we, had to, we had to learn it all. Um, and I'm really, I'm really glad I did. I will uh, fast forward a minute when I talked to Bishop Mosley about going to seminary, Brooke Mosley, who was the uh, bishop here at the time of fast forward. Um, and Brooke said, um, I, I, I wanted to go to general seminary because that's where Brooke went. And he says, no, Lloyd, I think I'm gonna send you to Virginia. <laughs> that's a little, you need to be settled down a little bit. <laughs> so, and I'm glad I did. But the but there were there were other people like that. Um, when I was at in St. Matthew's Church, participating in YPF as as the youth group was called, EYC was called, and there was interaction with with St. Andrews, which was incredible, uh, an incredible beginning. Um, anyway, let me fast forward. I graduated from high school in 1952. And I went, went to work for Mill F. Davis Jewelers. Some of you may even know at 831 Market Street. And, and he was like a real father figure. He was incredible. Uh, he cared, really cared about his employees. But he, I think he had a special place in his heart for me. And I'm, I've always been, been happy about that. Um, anyway, uh, I, after a year, I enlisted in the Army. My God, I was I wasn't in the army two days before. I was wondering what in the world have I done? I, I enlisted. I was not drafted. I enlisted, and uh, the first thing that began to happen is people were yelling at us all, uh, and especially to be honest, the black soldiers, the black recruits. I can still remember turning my head to the guy next to me and saying, "What did we do?" It's a question that I used to ask when I was growing up in Wilmington about the animosity between us and what, black people and white people. Well, what did we do? Well, I couldn't figure it out. What, what, what have we done? 
and we always sort of took it into ourselves that somehow it was it was our our mis, misdeeds somehow. Um, but this idea of tuness is something that you you get to live with um, all through the army. I found myself uh, by the same token being a, a, a an African American couldn't couldn't hide from that. By the same token, for acceptance sake, um, living into someone else, um, seeing myself through the eyes of the other, you have no idea how powerful that is, not in a good sense, but to be looking through your eyes to determine my worth. That's what I did. And that's what a lot of black people do. That's what most of us have done. Um, it's probably different now because life is a little different, but I'm telling you what it was like for me. And so a lot of my struggle was, was, was trying to, be, to know who I was, who I am. Um, and, 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 this, and, and being so unreconciled in myself. Um, well, you know, I could tell a long story about the army. It had, had its ups and downs. Um, President Truman had integrated by executive order the armed forces, but it hadn't fallen, it hadn't come down to to every post and and, and every every um, battalion and company and so on. I can assure you that that is so. Uh... But anyway, I got out of the army and I went to the University of Delaware. <laughs> not Morehouse, not a not a, a, uh, a, a black college, but Delaware. And I'm not so sure, other than that it was close by, why I selected Delaware. It was a tough, a tough hill to climb. Um, I was one of maybe four or five black students in the freshman class. And not many of us, um, and no faculty. So it was a very tough experience uh, going to Delaware had a great education. And I'm thankful that I went to a great school. But it was a real tough, it was a tough act. I went to seminary, Virginia Seminary. Um, and um, I was married before seminary uh, ended. But I could not bring my family to Alexandria, Virginia, because there was no place for us. Can you imagine that? So I lived in a dorm with single people. Um, I wasn't allowed to be in the dorm, at least. I was by that time about the third or fourth black student who had been in Virginia Seminary. Um, but anyway, um, I uh, got through it all, got through Virginia Seminary. I, I a lot I could tell you about that. It was, a, it was a good education. There's where I met Jesus, for real. There's where I really became to, uh, came to understand um, what it really means um, that God is in each of us, that we all bear the image of God. That's where that really came from, from white faculty members who were obsessed with um, justice and righteousness and seeing that in Jesus. That's where I got that. And I remember in seminary thinking, you know, why didn't I... I didn't, I didn't get this in church, not even from Father Wilson. <laughs> so this is, this is a kind of a new way of seeing things. Um, and so um, when I graduated from seminary, I became an associate rector at St. Andrew's Church, Ape and Shipping, white congregation. Um, and when I was called there, uh, Brooke Mosley, the bishop, um, asked me after I'd waited too long to give a response, uh, he said, uh, are you going to answer Gordon Charlton's letter? He was the rector. Are you going to answer Gordon? Are you going to accept that call? And I said, well, Bishop, I'm still trying to think about it. And he said, well, let me put it to you this way. It's either there or it's nowhere in the Diocese of Delaware. There's nowhere else for you to go, period. Well, that hit like a, a nail driven. And so I did accept the call. And I'm so glad I did. I'm really glad I did. Uh, it was, first of all, Gordon Charlton 
presented me as the priest who was, uh, which was to be a priest for everybody there, not there just to recruit black people. He did everything he could to, to kind of pave the way. And it really was a great experience. I was there for about five years. And then I went back to St. Matthew's Church, where I'd grown up, to be the rector. Um, so you, you can tell where this is going. Um, after some years, I, I, while, while in Wilmington, um, several serious things happened. You've heard about the occupation of troops for nine months. I was right in the midst of that. In fact, I was one of the community leaders during that time. Um, when Governor Terry uh, called the National Guard in and refused, even at the request of uh, the mayor of Wilmington and the new county executive, he refused. Because for him, this was a political thing. Uh, he wanted to frighten the people of Wilmington and say, you, you, you've got, we've got to keep the guard, we've got to take care of you. Um, um, Russ Peterson from DuPont Company ran for governor and that was the first plank of his platform was if he was elected, he would remove the guard. So I found myself, you know, working for Russ Peterson and in the group that uh, uh, challenged the governor and, and so on. But the, the, that, those riots, I call them unrest. They weren't really all that bad, but they were bad enough. Um, but, but when you consider the problems that the people of Wilmington were living in, the segregation that I described growing up hadn't changed in all those years. Um, school had uh, a little bit, um, but um, healthcare, um, living in, in housing, employment and so on, still bad. And so um, when Dr. King was assassinated, it was sort of like lighting a match and um, the Wilmington went up in arms. I'll never forget that day. It uh, was a Thursday. I was teaching a class at, at St. Andrews, uh, a history class. And I got a call that Dr. King had been shot. And then before I left the church, I got a call that he had died. But, and I, I lived nearby, so walking home, the Clover Dairy building was burning. And you know what I said? I heard myself say, burn it down. I was so upset myself. I saw that there was no chance that all the things that I thought that I was coming from seminary to teach and to lead was, was not going to have any validity. Nobody was trusting that at all. If a guy like Dr. King could be assassinated, whose only crime was that he had a dream, that all people would live together in peace and harmony, that there would be justice for all. If he was going to be assassinated for that, what is, what's, what's, what, what's there to live for? What is there to die for? So that, that was a real struggle. Um, I did do, manage to do some things. I've got some job training program. I called the leadership of Wilmington together to talk about things that we could do and, and so on. And there were some meaningful interactions, um, which, which, which I can answer in questions if we get there. I don't want to, to uh, take too much time. Um, I left Wilmington to go to Trinity Church, Wall Street. Yeah, Wall Street. Now, when I, when I uh, first got the call, um, I said, uh, I was still, I was at St. Matthew's by then. By the way, I forgot to tell you, I have to tell you this. I was the first African-American president of the Wilmington public school system that I described to you when I, growing up. And if, if you wanna know what it's like to preside at board meetings where the community is beginning to have a sense of itself and taking on Father Cassidy and everybody else, it was really an incredible experience. Um, trying to um, make, make the school system really uh, a, a source of quality education. I have to tell you, you will not believe this, but as the president of the board, um, while um, Delaware had not, after 1954, um, really gotten its act together as far as 
school integration is concerned. And as a matter of fact, I was in the army when Brian Bowles and the um, National Association for White People in Seaford or somewhere, uh, uh, you all probably, some of you know about this, uh, fought integration in 1954. And so schools were actually closed rather than integrated. And church schools were, were developed and so on. So um, by the time I was the president of the board, we were again talking about the need to, to really integrate the whole system. And initially, I was opposed to busing, <laughs> believe it or not, because I felt that what was most important was a quality education for all students wherever they are especially since um, the reason why the schools were black were because, is because of where people were forced to live. And that our schools were not well-funded because our schools were based on, on the tax base. And as white people fled Wilmington, and they did in the 50s and 60s, our tax base eroded like you would not believe. And so we had even fewer resources. Um, my concern was to find another way to fund education. Um, well, I wasn't here to see that battle through. I left to go to Trinity Paris. Um, I certainly am glad to see where things are now. In, in other words, you can take for granted that there are black and white students and mixed student bodies. What you may not yet be able to take for granted is that the teachers particularly in schools that are predominantly white, really do know and understand the students they're teaching, which was one of my concerns all the way back um, early on. We, with questions, we can get into that some more. Um, when I went to Trinity Parish, uh, the Bishop of Delaware at the time said to me, you know, I, I said, well, why should I go there? And he said, sometimes you have to ask, why shouldn't you? Maybe, you, maybe you're called to go to that fat cat place and do something. So I did. And I went to, um, to Trinity and became the rector's deputy for parochial ministry, which was a fabulous job. I had St. Luke's School and I had the chapels. Most, most of the chapels, by the way, were huge congregations, but they were a part of the mother church. So they were all in my portfolio and a conference center and so on. So I had a one called Ministry of the Course, working for immigration. So I just had a ball with the money to do it, <laughs> actually doing some transforming ministry with staff support. And it was incredible. Now, Trinity was really wanted to do it and wanted, was glad that I did it because you know, I, I don't know whether the name James Foreman means anything to you, but uh, just before I went to Trinity, James Foreman had gone into Riverside Church, he was an African-American, and began to talk about reparations. <laughs> and Trinity Church, this wealthy parish, wealthier than any institution other than the Vatican, said, you know, we, 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 we can't have this. So we've got to have some people here. That's, that, I mean, you know, that's, that's why they wanted this black priest to come up there. So it's sort of, you know, ease, ease, ease things up a little bit. And they could say, well, we've got, got a black person here. And look, Look what he's doing. So, you know, I took advantage of that and had a, had a great ministry. Um, and then I was called to, um, and I did a lot of work, um, especially in housing and so on. I put together uh, interfaith housing uh, situation, and it was a very, very, very good ministry. Um, then I went to Washington Cathedral, uh, where I was the canon missionary of Washington Cathedral. And uh, there again, I was in this place where I, I could do things um, that were transformative um, through liturgy and education and so on. And I can answer questions when we get there. We're, I'm almost out of time, so you can ask me questions about some of this stuff. Um, but, but all I can say is that my, I found that my ministry had never changed after after Washington Cathedral, I went to be the sub-dean of St. John of Divine. And then I went to 815, the National Church, to be the social justice officer. Then I went to St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, <laughs> which was a wonderful ministry. And then destiny would, would have it. The two churches where I began 
were coming together to form one congregation. And I, once I realized they were serious, I said, yes, I'll come. I, let me just say this. Somehow, um, the intuitive spirituality that I grew up with, somehow <clears throat> I always knew that there was God. Not some image. I've never had an image of God. It's just always a sense of presence, of divine presence. And that that presence was really in all of us. Um, the Bible said we were created in God's image. Well, I, I, I kind of knew that that didn't mean white or black or brown or German or something. So it had to mean something else. And so I began to mature with that. And while, even while in the army, it began to, to um, what's the word? I think I began to have good wishes for everybody. That's all. Um, I, I wouldn't allow myself any longer after a while to be defined by all the stuff that I grew up with, with the, the two, uh, two sensibilities and two consciousnesses and uh, seeing myself through other people's eyes. It began to grow out of that. And in every place I went, um, my intuition was to bring people together, interfaith, ecumenical, um, in the two congregations, to me, that was a P.S. to raise these songs. For me, was bringing these two congregations together, which, by the way, were literally just a few blocks from each other for generations. One founded in 1820-something and the other in 1840. There the twain shall meet, except that St. Matthew's had begun as a Sunday school in St. Andrew, a, a Sunday school for Black people. Well, that was nice, you know. Um, and so, you know, we came back together, but not in the basement. We came back, and the first thing we did was to uh, remove um, plaques to people um, whose histories were, quote, questionable. Um, we redid the church. Not, we didn't destroy it at all. It's still the be most beautiful colonial building, but, must, but very beautiful. Um, and it became um, literally a house of prayer for all people. And um, it, it's liturgy, it's program, it's outreach. Um, so much so that it began to bring people attracted to it, not just from the two congregations. When St. John's Cathedral closed, the majority of its parishioners joined St. Andrew and Matthew. And people are still coming because they believe in that dream. And now, so that's what has sustained me, the, the recognition that in spite of everything, um, that dream uh, is still there, even now. Um, how, how, how wonderful is it that even after everything, including an insurrection, there are people not only all around the country, but all around the world who are marching on behalf of justice and righteousness and peace. So I sense that God's working God's purpose out somehow, even in the madness that is going on. And so I think my job as a priest, I'm retired now, but I'm, I'm still here <laughs> but until my last breath uh, will be to uh, do my part to make sure that the church becomes faithful to its call. It has no other call than to, to take the cross of Jesus and follow Jesus, to deny itself. That is to say, to go not from a, a, a church that is concerned about maintaining itself, but a church that move, moves from maintenance to mission. There really is a, a, a marked difference. If we're worried about maintenance, we're not going to say the right things or do the right things. But if we're really concerned about mission, then we will do as Jesus did. We will give of ourselves, lock, stock, and barrel. I hate to use that expression. But all of ourselves, dying to ourselves, 
um, so that all might live. And that's the role of the church. That's the role of the church. And it's really going to require some huge changes in our congregation and how we minister to become beloved community, as we are now using the term. Um, it will not be easy. But the church will not survive, in my view, uh, not as, as the body of Christ, if we don't, if, if we don't go this way. Uh, I've gone over three minutes, <laughs> so I'll stop. And uh, I'm, I'm, I hope that you have questions and I can- There are quite a few. There are hmm? quite a few, Lloyd, so I'll feed them to you, but thank you for sharing that and thank you for, for your vulnerability and availability to us in, in our time of conversation and discernment. Um, Tim and Ingrid Miller wanted to ask you, do you feel that it was a benefit to have black teachers as role models? Yes, of course. And they were. And as a matter of fact, they, they were, they, they required so much of us. Um, they would say, uh, you know, you, you've got to learn it. You've got to know. We had to know it all. I mean, you know, black teachers concerned about um, their black students, their children would say, if you're going to make it in this white world, you got to know everything. You got to be better than that. That's, that's the kind of education we had. That's the kind of energy that was behind the teacher. You got to be better than it. You got to be smarter than that. Some of us maybe are, and some of us maybe are not. But, but yeah, they were, they really were role models. And as I say, they were role models because they were, some of them were in the NACP and doing things, other things. They were teaching, they were working for change in, in, in the community. They were uh, teaching us in Bible school. I mean, there was almost uh, no, no lines between the teacher uh, in school and the teacher elsewhere. When I say it takes a village, I really mean that. Yes, they, they were. And some of my most uh, favored, I remember every teacher by name from kindergarten through high school. Let's put it that way. I haven't forgotten one name. And my senior warden at St. Matthew's Church had been my seventh grade social studies teacher. <laughs> oh. So, so <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> Uh, Carol Conroy, uh, I'm just doing, people put comments, but I'm just doing the questions. Uh, Carol Conroy follows that up with, um, uh, I've heard graduates of DuPont School nearby speak with both pride and a sense of loss. Was integration a good thing for communities of color? I recall comments from hidden figures about the consequences. Yeah, I would, I would say that it's a mixed bag for the reasons that I've already mentioned. Um, in the beginning, there was no preparation for this integration. Um, teachers were not sensitized at all. Um, and, and so um, kids who were confused, trying to find themselves in this new place, no matter what their confusion was, would be looked at, for example, as, as a del delinquent problem or, or a, a, a problem of behavior and so on. So there was a lot of a lot of treatment, mistreatment of, of kids um, just because they weren't, they weren't understood. And that the, the, the norm, of course, was white education, white life, that was the norm. And so the students, the, the, the black students had to find this norm and it wasn't easy. I can tell you as the president of the school board visiting many schools, I saw, um, with a lot of pain, how difficult this was. And yet, you know, let's face it, there were real friendships that got developed and some great teachers, white and black. And there were black teachers and principals later on in, in some of the white schools. And so it, it did happen, it began gradually to happen. So now we can take integration for in schools for granted, somewhat um, in public schools and urban schools, um, because of the housing situation, it's not much different to tell the truth. But, um, you know, there's no question that at some point we all need to be living and moving and working and having our being together. But there's something false about um, 
uh, an education where white privilege remains white privilege. Um, and that those are the eyes and hearts through which um, the teachers view the, the, the students that they're teaching and even the black teachers and principals who come to their schools. Uh, I, I need to not talk too long because I'm sure. Sorry for my long answer. But. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, John Michael uh, wanted to know how long between your time at Trinity Wall Street and Sam? Um, I was at Trinity twice, by the way. My first tour of duty at Trinity was from, from 1972 to 1976. Um, that's when I was the rec rector's deputy with all these programs I described. Then I went to uh, Washington Cathedral in 1976, and I stayed to 1985, nearly 1986. Then I came to St. John the Divine to be the assistant dean, the sub-dean of the cathedral. And then I went back to Trinity Church to be in charge of, of Trinity Church, the vicar of the church, of the mother church. So um, I don't know, John Michael, whether that uh, is helpful or not, but that's the, uh, so, so then uh, um, I left tr Trinity and, and went to 815, left Trinity in about uh, 1993 or four, something like that. And I went to work at 815 as a social justice officer of the Episcopal Church, uh, which was also uh, interesting. I, I've got to tell you this, I used to, of course, write letters and things to rectors and vicars and so on. <laughs> one, of the, one of the funny things was to be uh, at the same time the priest in charge of St. Mark's in the Bowery and reading the letters that I was sending out to clergy and realizing how stupid they were <laughs> and how impossible, you know, how meaningless they would be to the average priest just because of, you know, I'm coming from all this bureaucracy and stuff and you can hear priests saying, well, what's this all about, you know? So anyway, it was a, it, it was a good learning. So anyway, I left um, uh, St. Mark's in the Bowery in 815 at the same time in 1997. I was called um, in 19, at the end of 1996, but I came uh, in, in uh, February 1997 to, to Sam. And I left 10 years later, 2007. Great. Um, uh, Greg DeRoss uh, qu wonders uh, how your experiences were in Washington. He's said he's heard horrible stories concerning the treatment of uh, the first female bishop in, in uh, D.C. Did you have similar experiences as an African-American? I think they were, they were mixed. I was, I was on the bishop's staff who was African-American, and I, he, he had difficult times. He was a good bishop, John Walker. Um, and uh, the cathedral had fallen into some real hard times under the deanship of Frank Sayre, the longtime uh, dean of Washington Cathedral. So the bishop decided to become the dean, not only the bishop, but the dean of the cathedral uh, and appoint a provost so that they could get a handle on the, on the financial crisis. Um, and there, there were times when when I could sense that people, even in leadership, standing committee and so on, um, had a kind of distrust of the bishop, um, the bishop's ability to manage and so on. He would happen to be a very good manager. He was very, very good. But um, there were people who, who would find reasons to, um, um, to not be, to not, give him the allegiance that I think he was due. Now, this was not all across the board. He was, he was really a beloved bishop, but there were these corners. There were parishes that, that uh, refused to, for all other kinds of reasons, but basically because he was a black bishop. Um, I, I was on the staff of Washington Cathedral. I preached and celebrated and so on, just like everybody else. Um, I didn't have a problem on the staff, I did, my problems were people simply surprised when they met Canon Lloyd Casson in, in, in the, uh, physically, and realized that he was black, and the surprise that comes with that. It just, 
no expectation that the canon missioner of Washington Cathedral might be African American. Wow. Uh, well, this is a last chance for anybody who wants to type in a question, but I'm while I'm waiting for that, I'm just going to ask you a question from, from my perspective, Lloyd, which, um, first of all, I want to thank you for, again, for meeting with us tonight. Um, this is part of our uh, year of inclusion and engagement, and I would ask you, what, what do you think is the most important thing that a predominantly white congregation could be doing um, to engage and work on the work of full inclusion for the body of Christ? I, I think two things. Number one, um, you're very fortunate where you are because there are lots of great organizations that are concerned about issues of justice uh, in Sussex County. You've got some great ones. And um, so uh, in terms of addressing issues, problems, um, there. I would say you've got, a, you've got lots of support. But if you really want my opinion, and you've just asked for it, I think that the interior uh, work of our congregation is, is more important than we give credit for. Um, the issue of white privilege, the issue of not knowing who we are and living in a bubble and living in uh, in a, in a, through a sense of ourselves that is not real. We all need, through spiritual practices, really, through literally spiritual practices, le learning how to empty ourselves from our bubbles, um, learning how to um, depend and recognize the true value and worth of ourselves. Um, you know, from before the foundation of the earth, um, that that's where our worth comes from. Not because we're white or black or because we're rich or poor or gay or straight, but because we are. And, that, and learning, we all have to do this. And we black Americans, we've got to do this. We have so ourselves bought into the lie of white privilege and white racism that we've defined ourselves that way too. So that we either try to be white or we, we, we are ashamed of ourselves and so on and, and find ourselves, um, you know, acting out just like people might expect us to. And so living these two minds we, and sin, sin, the classical definition of sin is separation from self and from each other and from God. That's the classical definition of sin. Definition of sin. So we're all we all need healing and absolution. And we need liturgical and pastoral care together, healing one another, uh, telling one another stories, having safe spaces where you can really talk about this. White people need to talk to each other about when did you first realize you were white? Because I can tell you, I, I, I always knew I was black. Um, you didn't have to think about that. When was the first time? And, and, and what, and, you know, what, what's normal? What should be normal? That's a long answer, but, uh, and, and, I, and I don't mean don't do the, the, the stuff ecumenically and interfaith for justice and criminal justice reform. Those things are very important, but you can do that and still do that through the mentality of white privilege. You know, we're doing something for you. And what has to happen is we've got to do this for each other. This, I'm talking about changing transformation of not only this nation, but this world, beginning with ourselves. Profound spiritual transformation. Well, thanks, Lloyd. And several people chimed in and said that uh, they re highly recommend the uh, Sacred Ground program that uh, Carlisle and Carol have started here. We have two more groups that are going to be forming, and please be in touch with Carlisle or Carol if you're interested in participating in the them. I, I, I really resonate with what you're saying, Lloyd, because I, I do think that it, beyond just the racial issues that have struck our country in the last couple of years, I think We've also realized firsthand the spiritual dearth of um, uh, of the depths of of uh, our spiritual needs, 
as, mm -hmm. as members and citizens and 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 really um, the pain of the isolation and separation that we've allowed to creep up in our society racially and in so many other ways. Um, it's an interesting time to be a clergy person, that's for sure. <laughs> I'll say this, I think it's a joyful time. I think, I think as awful as things are, we have to, we have to approach all of this with joy, with the joy yeah. of service in Christ. We really, really do. Because so I think, if we ever did this, we wouldn't have to worry about invite, welcome, and connect. That would be easy, <laughs> you know, really. But, but we, we have sunk down so low. Um, we are so separated from, our, from who we are meant to be. Um, and and from each we other. may not notice it, but everybody else does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Lloyd, thank you again for your time. We're, we're just about out of time tonight. Um, Lloyd and, and Mark, we, we're really privileged to have both of them uh, to speak to us in this series. I call them the conscience of the diocese. I know they uh, get embarrassed every time I say that, but I will tell you at convention, whenever Lloyd or Mark stands up, everybody's heads go up to see what they're gonna tell us. Um, it's because we're old. <laughs> Uh, one of the best uh, speeches I've ever heard on a convention floor, floor was when Lloyd stood up and spoke out about um, how we're losing personhood by making corporations into people. And uh, I still remember that from my first year uh, here in the diocese, Lloyd. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, our presentation next year or next week, sorry, will be from um, a member of uh, Lewis, somebody who's grown up here, an African American, uh, Bill Colick. Some of you know him from his famous football days, um, and he has been active and involved with the Southern Delaware Alliance for Racial Justice, one of the groups that Lloyd was talking about um, that uh, many of our parishioners have been involved with. If you're not involved with it and would like to be, I'd be glad to help connect you. Um, but Bill will be talking about what uh, Lewis has been like and what it's been like to live here uh, for all of his life. Just a reminder too that uh, TJ and our choir are offering uh, Compline tonight and every Thursday during Lent at 7.30. It is not a Zoom meeting. It is on our YouTube channel and Facebook Live. So make sure you take go and look it up for it there. And I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you all for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. And Lloyd, thank you. Thank again. you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy forum, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.